Here we go. I've got two questions for you as we do this battle board series. First is what is your giant? I think you have to name it. What is the biggest, most significant issue in your life that is keeping you from being and doing everything that God wants you to be and do? I think it's important to identify that thing. And so I'm asking all of us to write it down. Like write it down on your connection card. Just you know, put giant and, and, then, and then write that thing down. Whatever it is. You write it down so, so that you can identify it. We can be on this journey together of the giants that we're fighting uh, alongside. I don't know how long you've been fighting your giant. You might have been in this battle with a giant for, for the past seven days. Maybe it's been 40 days. Maybe it's been 40 weeks. I don't know. It could have been 40 years. Maybe even longer. It's just been hanging around. It's the biggest issue in your life. The one you don't really like to talk about. You know, maybe it's an addiction. It started with just one. One drink. One puff. One cigarette. One, one moment of experimentation. And now you're hopelessly bound by this habit. And you desperately want to be free, but you've given up. You've tried every program. You've tried every remedy, every online thing. And it seems like you're never going to win the battle. Maybe you've been fighting anxiety or panic attacks for years. And you never know when the next one's going to pop up. It's like this shadow. And you've given up on it ever changing. Maybe you've been living with, with low self-esteem for as long as you can remember. You just don't feel like you measure up. And so you see, you see yourself as a failure or as less than. And you've resigned yourself to the fact that you'll always feel this way. You just learn to live with it. Because the giant's too big. Maybe you've been in unhealthy relationship after unhealthy relationship. Marriages that have failed. Dating relationships. Even friendships. And you are convinced that you'll never be able to have a, have a happy, healthy relationship with anyone. And that's the giant in your life. I mean, your giant could be shame. It could be guilt. Loneliness. Doubt. Overeating. Pornography. Lust. Worry. It could be all kinds of things. Your giant might be a person. A relationship. A marriage issue, a financial situation, a career issue. Everyone faces different giants. So what is your giant? Name it. Put a name on it. Second question. What, what's keeping you from destroying that giant? What stands between you and, and victory? Why is that thing still in your life? Now, I don't know what giant you might be dealing with, but I've got good news for you. God has a plan. Now, I have a very uh, specific agenda in this series, which is this. I want you to overcome the biggest challenge in your life. With God's help, you can fight and destroy the biggest issue in your life. You can take on the giant and you can win. It doesn't have to last forever. And, and what I believe is, is that on the other side of it, you come out changed. Because whenever you step onto a battlefield and you defeat a giant in your life, you don't leave the battlefield the same. And so that's why we're calling this series Battle Born. Because every time you and I get through a battle, it's like we're reborn into this, this new person, this different person. And, uh, and I believe uh, that just like our state motto for Nevada is Battle Born, I believe that we can be people that are battle born we can be a church that is battle born and so i want all of us to be battle born people that are taking on the giants in our life and so you've got a bookmark uh, on your 
on your chair. And, and, and what I want you to do is I want you to take that bookmark with you, and, and it, it looks like this. On the front of it, it has uh, the, the, the series graphic, and then at the bottom it says 1 Samuel 17, 1 through 54. What I'm asking all of us to do this week is I want you to take this bookmark with you, and I want you to put it somewhere where you're going to see it, and I want you to read through this entire story at least once this week. Because I want each of us uh, to be discovering truths about being battle-born in this story. And, and so I want, to, I want to see what we're discovering on our own as we read the story, and I want to hear about them. So I want you guys to email me. Uh, I want you, you know, I want you to message me. Uh, you know, I'm on Facebook and Instagram and, and the Twitter. I'm on Snapchat, but I'm not good at it. Uh, I'm trying to figure that one out and be better at it. But what I want us to discover is what is God speaking to us? What are we learning from this story on our own? And so I want you to read it once a week, and I want you to, to message me uh, about what you're learning. So last week we kicked off this series, and we went through the first 16 verses. Uh, of this story in 1 Samuel 17. Now, if you didn't get to join us for that gathering, um, you, can, you can watch the talk from last week on U- Sought Church's YouTube channel. Just search for Sought Church. Now, let's, let's just take a, a moment and review. The, Phil- the, the Israelite army and the Philistine army were facing off across this big valley. And war was imminent between the two nations, but the Philistine army had a major advantage. And the major advantage was named Goliath. For 40 days, Goliath, their greatest warrior, walked out and he issued a challenge to the Israelite army. Goliath was, was over nine feet tall. He was imposing, he was intimidating, and Goliath challenged one man, any man, to step up and to fight him in a representative battle. If Goliath won, then it would be like the entire Philistine army uh, won and would declare victory. If the Israelite won, then the Israelite army would declare victory. And so it was man on man, winner take all. And this giant intimidated King Saul and his entire army. No Israelite was willing to fight. And so it was 40 days of intimidation and fear. It looked like there was no hope. But God had a plan to deliver the Israelites from fear and from intimidation and from the enemy. And so the giant issued his challenge for 40 days. And then meanwhile, far away from the front lines, this is what's happening. And we're going to pick up this story in 1 Samuel chapter 17, uh, verse 17. So if you have a Bible, you can open it up uh, to 1 Samuel 17. If you don't have a Bible with you, we would love to give you one. We have one out at our concierge cart, or you can download the app to your phone, bible.com slash app, and we will have the verses here on the screen. So off front lines, the battle's happening. And one day, Jesse said to David, Take this basket of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers. And give these ten cuts of cheese to their captain. See how your brothers are getting along and bring a report on how they're doing. Now Vegas uh, is no stranger to the kickback, right? Well, Jesse wasn't either. So, you know, he sends a little extra cheese along with, you know, hey, give this to the captain, give him a little kickback, maybe it will grease the wheels for his boys. Not a bad strategy, you know. And he says, hey, I want you to see how your brothers are doing. And then bring me a report on them. And David's brothers were with Saul and the Israelite army at the Valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Now, Jesse is understandably worried, just as any parent is, uh, when their kid is on the battlefield. He's especially worried because... He thought that his sons were in a fierce battle against the Philistine army. Now it's true, they're at the battleground, but they're not fighting. They're running scared. David was sent by his father to take snacks to his brothers. To make sure that they're all right and to let them know that their dad was concerned. David was most certainly not there to fight. David is the Old Testament equivalent of the pizza delivery boy. David is Postmates before there's Postmates. He's just delivering food 
to the guys who are actually doing the real work. Now, because this is an infamous story, and, and because we know the ending, in fact, uh, I saw a clip uh, today of it using this same story to describe an NFL game that was happening between the Patriots uh, and the Jaguars about David versus Goliath. Like, it was, that's the thing that was, ha- we know the story, right? It, it, it's kind of like this common theme. And so, we often read it, and, and we see David's arrival on the scene, and, and we read it like, oh, here comes the hero. Here he comes. But that's not, we're reading the story after David was battle born, after he's defeated the giant. David wasn't a trained warrior. He's a shepherd, he's a musician. He's the most unlikely hero imaginable. Jesse, who, who's, this, who, who's David's father, ha, has no idea that his youngest son is a giant killer. David wasn't a soldier. He's a delivery boy. He's too young to be in the battle. I mean, I, I, I've got a question for you. How, how old is the right age to kill a giant? How old is the right age to deliver a nation? For that matter, how old is the right age to be a missionary and tell others about Jesus? How old is, is the right age to, to stand up for righteousness? How old is the right age to take a stand for Jesus? How old is the right age to make a difference? How old is the right age to change a world? Is there a magic number? You know, a special birthday? And all of a sudden you're old enough? I mean, you know, birthday, I, I can remember, you know, the, the birthday thing. You know, you just, you're waiting. And it, that, that first one seems to be 10 years old, which is that really special one. Because now you're double digits. You know, you've got two digits in your age. And you're excited about that. And, and then uh, the, the next big one was like 13. I'm a teenager now. You know, I've, uh, this it must be good now, you know. Uh, and then, of course, 16. Thank goodness I get my driver's license. Everyone's looking forward to that 16th birthday, you know. And then 18. Man, I'm 18. I'm an adult. And, Nothing's changed in my life. I'm still living with my parents, but I'm 18 years old. I'm an adult, you know, uh, and you, you feel good about that. And then, then you got 21, you know, which is, which is especially meaningful in Nevada. Uh, and then you, you hit 25. I like 25. 25 was a good birthday for me because 25 means your car insurance rates go down and you can rent a car without paying the extra fee. So I was really excited about that one. Is there, is there some kind of special age where it's like, oh, I could go kill giants now? Some kind of special birthday where that comes up? We need some young warriors and young champions in our church today. The reality is, is that there, there, those of us who are older, and, and I include myself in that, uh, have allowed some giants to remain for way too long. And I believe that God is preparing children and students to take on giants that we've been unwilling to fight and unable to conquer. It's a priority for me, because <laughs> uh, I've got three children who I want to be giant killers. But it's, it's more than that, because I believe it's the obligation of every church to prepare the next generation of leaders to be giant killers instead of being intimidated by the giants of culture and society. I want us to be a church. The, the, one of the reasons that we're meeting at this time in the evening, 6 p.m., is because it's still early enough for kids to come and be able to make it to bed. We are committed to seeing kids and students be giant killers. We, the, the reality is, in our current climate, in our current culture, the church is losing ground. I don't say that as like a, uh, you know, the sky is falling. I, it's just reality. We, we can't keep doing what we've always been doing and expect to get something different. 
we, we have to be committed uh, to, to seeing the next generation rise up and slay some giants. And so, you know, that's why we do things like kids' church. We don't, we don't do it to get kids out of the way. We have kids' church because we want to train them to be giant killers. We need to continue to push in this area. We need to be committed uh, to seeing students and, and kids impacted. And, and for some of us, that, that means that we need to volunteer in the kids' area. And we need to invest in their lives. For some of us, that means that we need to get connected with, with the kids in our neighborhood. I know it seems like so strange, like, like oh, are, what, what are people going to think? Like, no, like, we need to be mentors. We need to find ways that we can invest in kids and invest in children and, and, and be a part of their lives. And, and so we need to find, we're going to ask, uh, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you for more time and for more prayer and more patience and more money as we figure out ways to invest in the generations uh, that are behind us, to invest in high schoolers and middle schoolers and elementary kids and people that are in preschool. We want to make sure that those kids know that they're every bit as qualified to lead people to Jesus. They're every bit as qualified as you or as I uh, I or you, I <laughs> did the motions backwards, uh, to pray for people, uh, to share their faith, to make a difference. They aren't a bunch of delivery boys. They're giant killers. And we want them to know that we believe in them. And so this church will always be committed to see the next generations accomplish God's plan. Otherwise, we won't be a church for very long. Now, I believe that that means that, that we have to make sacrifices for the next generation. And if you're not willing to do that, you're probably going to be miserable. At least here. <laughs> uh, it's really not all that different from your family. You know. Grandparents, grandparents don't demand attention or demand stuff in their family. Uh, it, it, for a grandparent, the number one person in the family is grandchildren. Now, my kids are the only grandkids on both sides of the family. And so you wouldn't imagine how much stuff they get, what they get away with. My mom lets my kids get away with stuff that I'm like, who is this person? Like, I, I don't know who, like, I... Uh, that's not the mother I grew up with, and that's certainly, it's, it's exactly true. It's not the mother I grew up. It's with the grandmother that my kids grow up with. Uh, it's, it's completely different uh, because the, the grandparents uh, sacrifice and love and invest for those kids. Why would it be any different in their church? Why wouldn't we want to do that? The right age to be a champion and a, and a giant killer is whatever age you learn to depend on God and the power of the Holy Spirit instead of your own ability. It doesn't matter how old you are. It matters how much of God is in you. That's true of students, but it's just as true of adults. You know, being an adult turning 21, 25, 30, 40, 50, however, however long you want to count on, doesn't magically turn you into a giant killer. There, there's no age that does that. What matters is how much of God is in you. The people that, that might say, well, you're not old enough, or, or you're too old. And sometimes the, the person that says, you're too old to change, is the voice inside our heads. Oh, well, I'm just... I'm just too old. I've, I've always been that way. No, it, that, that's because we, that, that, that voice just doesn't have enough of God in them to, to trust uh, in His unexpected plan, in His unlikely hero, uh, to see the victory. You have got to go fight the battle. You've got to go take on the giant. David is too young for the battlefield, uh, but he's out there. He, and off he goes. And at this point in the story, David knows very little about what's happening. 
He, he doesn't know what's happening between the Israelites and the Philistines. He'd never heard of Goliath. All that he knew was that his three older brothers were off fighting in Saul's army, and he was supposed to have a field trip, get out of the sheep fields for a little bit, and bring them some snacks. Now there's no reason that, that the Israelite army would think that today is going to be different from any other day. Goliath was going to come out once again and he's going to issue his challenge and he's going to intimidate and, and the army of Israel is going to be afraid. Only on this day God had something else in mind. These battle-hardened veterans were afraid to fight. There's these experts that aren't willing to take on the giant. There's, there's people who've been there and done that, and so they were no longer willing to go there or do that. And since they weren't willing to take it on, God sent a student, a teenage boy. God decided to use an unlikely hero, a young shepherd boy, to defeat an intimidating giant. You may not feel qualified to take on your giant. You know, you've, you, you've maybe been waiting to learn the latest technique or to meet an expert or, you know, have someone pray the right prayer for, over you. Well, God doesn't need a star or an expert. God uses unlikely heroes. And God will use you. I, I think one of the reasons that God uses this, this simple shepherd boy, this simple musician, is because he wanted to give you a confidence that, that he could use a housewife, a businessman, a maintenance man, a single mom, a retired teacher, a businesswoman, an accountant, a student, a child, a grandparent. He could use you. What qualifies you to defeat a giant? What, what qualifies you to overcome the biggest hurdle it has nothing to do with you. And it has everything to do with the God you serve. It's not about your strength or your power or your knowledge or your experience or your ability. It's about God inside you. God is going to work through you to defeat your giant. Now, David's own father didn't see his potential. Jesse sent every single one of his sons off to battle except for David. Jesse didn't believe that David had the potential to, to fight and, and to defeat an imposing enemy. This wasn't some stranger who doesn't know David, kind of like just looking at him and sizing him up. This is David's own father sizing him up based on his potential. David's own dad didn't believe that he had what it takes to take on the fight. Now listen closely. Others may not believe in your ability to fight giants. But we spend way too much time trying to convince people who aren't willing to fight that we're qualified to fight. Don't worry about it. They don't believe in you. And you're not going to convince them anyway. They don't want to fight the giant. They want to sit on the sidelines and criticize. And kind of just let some giants remain out there. In some cases, they themselves have become the giant. Don't waste any time on them. Don't decide to fight your battles based on the opinions of others. Leave them behind. Get out there and face your giant. Verse 20, so David left the sheep with another shepherd and set off early the next morning with the gifts as Jesse had directed him. He arrived at camp just as the Israelite army was leaving for the battlefield with shouts and battle cries. And, and soon the Israelite and Philistine forces stood facing each other, army uh, against army. And so the, here's this, this, this army that's just powerless. They're paralyzed by fear. And every day they had to wonder, well, is Goliath going to issue his challenge today? You know, is, today, is today the day that somebody else will, will stand up and, and face Goliath? Is someone going to get out here and, and fight? And, and every day for 40 days, no champion emerged. It had to be incredibly discouraging. 
I mean, can you imagine how low the, their self-esteem was? How, how powerless they felt? Same giant, every day, same frightened army. So David gets to the, the battlefield. He leaves his things with the keeper of the supplies. And he hurried out the, to the ranks to greet his brothers. And as he's talking with them, Goliath the Philistine champion from Gath, came out from the Philistine ranks. And then David heard him shout his usual taunt to the army of Israel. And as soon as the Israelite army saw, the, saw him, they began to run away in fright. Now understand, Goliath isn't fighting anybody. He's just yelling at them. And they run away. And so David comes and, and he sees that the troops are going out with their battle cries. And, and, and he's excited. He wants to watch. He wants to see what's going on. And so you can kind of picture this moment. David is up there. He's talking with his brothers. He's getting caught up. And then all of a sudden, there's this shout from across the ravine. And, and all of a sudden, David's standing there alone. Because the army took off and ran. And David's left holding the Lunchables. He's left holding the snacks, standing there all alone because everyone else runs back to their tents. Because David didn't know to be afraid. David didn't know to be afraid and run. David, remember, David's never heard this giant before. He's never seen this giant before. And so David looks across this battlefield and he sees this giant man covered with armor standing there shouting out threats, cursing God, and it makes David mad. And he thought, nobody, nobody talks about our God that way. Why in the world is everybody running away? Remember, this is, this is the 41st day that the Israelites had encountered Goliath. But it was the first day for David. David didn't know that he's supposed to be afraid and intimidated. David's ticked off and, he, and he's ready to fight. You remember... Um, some of those old video games like, like Centipede or, or Space Invaders, you know. Any of those games where you, your, your object is to kill the enemies as fast as you can because if you don't kill them fast enough, they just start to multiply and the army gets bigger and bigger and they, they just run at you. Well, that's how it is in life. The longer that you allow your giant to remain, the more intimidating it becomes. The longer you allow your giant to remain, the more intimidating it becomes. You have to deal with your giant immediately. The reason your giant seems so big and intimidating and impossible to overcome is because you've been facing that giant for way too long. It's not really bigger. It just seems bigger. You have to deal with your giant immediately. You have to start today. Start now. Well, you know, hey, Jake, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start my diet next week. My giant is, is eating. My giant's the, the way. I'm going to start my diet next week. I mean, I wouldn't want to start it before vacation. That just doesn't make sense at all. No, you've got to start now. If it's, if it's a giant worth defeating, you need to start now. Well, I'm, I'm waiting until my schedule isn't so busy. And then once my schedule isn't so busy, I, th I think I'll, I'll stop drinking then. You know, I, I've got this big project coming up at, at school or, or at work. And there's already kind of enough stress in my life. When things get a little more relaxed, I'll deal with it. But the reality is, is it never gets a little more relaxed or a little less busy. Well, you know, I'm just kind of tired right now. I, I don't really have the strength to do it. I, I'm, you know what? I'm going to wait. As soon as I feel better, as soon as I feel stronger, I'm going to defeat that giant. You know, And soon it becomes next week, and then next month, and then next year, and then the next decade. The battle isn't going to get any easier because you or I wait. In fact, it only gets harder. There will never be a better day than today to take on your giant. Verse 25. Now the Israelites have been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming up? He, he comes to defy, the, to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. And he will also give him his daughter in marriage and he will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. And so King Saul devises this incentive plan for killing the giant. He's trying to get somebody to take on the challenge. And so he promises him, 
wealth. He promises them uh, a marriage. And not only that, if you killed Goliath, then you and your entire family live tax-free forever. I mean, it's a good deal. But no amount of money could make any soldier cross the line and fight Goliath. Nobody volunteered. So David hears about this incentive plan. He hears the people talking about it, and he couldn't believe it. And so he asked the guys around him to make sure he's hearing this correctly. And in verse 26, he's, what? What's going to be done for, for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? So Saul is, is trying to motivate uh, these guys with wealth and instead of, of the cause that they should be fighting for. And so David comes with this whole different perspective. For David, it's not about wealth. It's about this cause. This giant was defying the armies of the living God. Goliath was causing the name of God to be diminished. And so David heard Goliath curse God. And, and with all of the innocence and the anger of a young boy, David said, well, what in the world? Are we going to let this guy talk about our God that way? I mean, we can't let this idiot live one more day. You will decide to face your giant when you finally realize the cost of allowing your giant to remain. I mean, if you've, if you've decided to fight a giant, I know that one of the things that, that kind of goes through each of our heads is how difficult it's going to be to fight our giant. How much it's going to cost you to fight that giant. How much effort and energy it's going to take. But have you considered the cost of allowing your giant to remain? How much is that addiction costing you? I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about health. I'm talking about trust relationship with with others and with God how much is the unforgiveness and the bitterness costing you how much is your uncontrolled temper at, at work or at home or with your family costing you what has worry and fear kept you from what's it costing you every issue in life is a is a price issue when you realize how much your giant is costing you and costing your family and costing the people around you and, and costing the people that you love and you know what, even more than this, costing your church and, and costing your, your neighborhood and your city, when you realize the cost, that's when you decide to fight. I mean, what's the cost going to be in 10 years, in, in 20 years? If, if we let this giant go on for the rest of our lives, then what's it going to cost me? It's time. Don't take it anymore. It, it, it's time to be mad enough and determined enough to fight because the giant has cost you way too much for way too long. It's time to fight. It's time to look at your giant and say, you can't win. I will not allow you to remain in my life. And you might be thinking, okay, I'm ready to fight. Tell me how. Well, you've got to keep reading the story. You've got to keep reading the story. Over the next four weeks, that's what we're going to do. We're going to dig in deep, and we're going to learn from David about how to defeat our giants. But before you can, before you can figure out how, you've got to figure out, is it worth it for you? Have you, have you finally realized the cost of allowing that giant to remain? Fight. You were born to kill giants. You've got to fight. Not because you have power or ability. Not because you have might. But because you serve the God of all creation. And His power is inside of you. The God who fights is in you. And he will fight for you.